This is the second um, lecture on Thessalonians. There will be four, uh, each of which is a half an hour in length, and so this is the second one. We already talked about um, some of the details that went into Paul's writing of this letter. And we get to uh, uncover a little bit more of that as we go along. But certainly, Paul um, is trying to check up on a congregation that he first expanded upon in his three-week visit in um, that you see in Acts chapter 16 and 17. And so he wants to revisit the church. He's heard that there are some who are upset that he has gone away and not provided any kind of help to them. And this is the letter that provides some help. You can follow along in the presentation writings of Paul. And I will be referring to a couple of other things that you don't have, but that shouldn't pose very many difficulties. We'll try to explain things pretty clearly. So we're in chapter 1. We have finished chapter 1. Uh, best to have a text open if you can. I will read the portions that I think are important, but obviously I can't read the whole thing. Um, so, in chapter 1, he sets out commending them, thanking God for them, and we talked just a bit about the theology involved, that Paul has this embedded theology that um, is real. And I want to stress that again. This is not an imaginary thing for Paul. This is very real. The threats that Paul faces, the things that Paul looks at, these are all very real things, and they all have a theocentric and cruciform point of view. That is, God first, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God revealed in the text and in the events of the Old Testament that Paul knows very well from his Pharisaic background. And he has noticed that the Holy Spirit has worked inside of these people. And so uh, in verse 6 of chapter 1, um, it says, uh, he received, they received the word in much affliction, with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. That'll be a common theme that the Thessalonian believers have somehow come to know him in a personal way. And that is a that is one element in this letter. This letter of Paul's is the least polemical. That is, it's the least, um, it's for, well, it's not angry. He's not trying to drive home any particular point. This really is a check-in letter that's meant to encourage this fledgling church. And the letter, its occasion is that Paul has been away. He sends Timothy back to check on the church in Thessalonica while he stays in Athens. And then when Timothy returns, Timothy gives Paul a report, and um, Paul then responds with this letter. So in some ways, it's one of the most personal of all of uh, Paul's letters. And so we left off uh, last time with chapter 1, so we go to chapter 2, and um, Paul first explains that he had intended to visit, but has not been able to come back. Um, and he says that their first visit was not in vain, and that the Thessalonian church has um, received the word that they have given, a word approved by God in 2.4, a word that's meant uh, to honor God and not to just to please other folks, uh, Paul says they did not seek uh, the glory of persons, not the Thessalon Thessalonians or from anyone else, but they are trying to meet the demands of apostles. And those demands usually are quite rigorous. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, we're going to find some lists in Paul that the apostles had to put up with many sufferings as a result of this witness and this claim. The tender, the tenderness of chapter 2 is not to be missed in verses 6 and following. He says they were gentle, like a nurse taking care of her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, 
because you had become very dear to us. There's no way that you can look at the at Thessalonians or at Paul and think he didn't care. Paul cared a great deal. In fact, Paul's care is um, eternal. Paul feels like the weight of eternal glory is on his shoulders and that he is the one to bear witness to this uh, weight and to this glory to the, to the people that God uh, sends his way. Verse 9 takes a turn. It says, we remember, you remember, our labor and toil as we work night and day um, to not burden any of you while we preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our behavior to you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each of you and encouraged you and charged you to lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is going to be a little bit of a theme um, for the for the Thessalonians that behavior matters. Now there aren't any real specifics here, um, at least not yet, with the exception of labor and toil, and the work that these did. Um, he says that the Thessalonians were witnesses to it, and God also. And then the behavior pieces, holiness, righteousness, and blamelessness in, our, in terms of their behavior. And in this, they were supposed to encourage uh, the Thessalonians. And then the verse 12, to lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, that's an interesting word right there, to lead a life worthy. In verse 12 of chapter 2, and that word connotes the sense of being a good citizen, in, in Roman imperial terms, to be a good citizen meant to mirror the trends and the culture and the ethos that you could find in the center of the empire. And so in any Roman colony, uh, when a dignitary was supposed to come and the visit was known, the whole city would get, get ready. People would have their hair done in the current Roman style. Togas would be on sale. And the idea was to curry favor with those who were visiting so that they could then take back a good report to the people in Rome who had the authority to give benefits or take benefits away. And so this term, to live a life, um, to live a life worthy of the gospel, it's going to surface on a number of occasions in Paul. And it serves to uh, highlight the citizenship required. And so that does require a certain uh, adjustment, um, a certain uh, change in behavior from what was previously there. Verse 13 and following is a little strange, so let's walk through this uh, to the end of the chapter. Um, so Paul has been busy thanking God. Verse 2 of chapter 1, he thanks God for, uh, for all of them. And he thanks God for the good witness that they have uh, evidenced. And he, uh, he also uh, wants to thank God uh, here in verse 13. Because he says that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of man or humankind, but as what it really is. The word of God which is at work in you believers. So Paul's expression of the gospel, he roots, right to, he roots theologically in his knowledge of God. God is the one who gives the message, and the authentication of that message is its power, that it really does, as Paul says here, works in the lives of those who believe. And then verse 14, the, what, how does it work? The, the, the people in the church become imitators of all the churches, and in this way, they become uh, imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea. And here's the kicker. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. And then verse 15 is, is pretty close to polemic, isn't it? Who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove, out, uh, and drove us out and displease God and oppose all men. This is uh, by, in verse 16, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. 
it was kind of a, a bummer verse, right? And and um, the Thessalonians have somehow suffered. Now, if you go back to Acts and you re- relive some of Paul's interaction there, you know that the three weeks was not an easy time. Paul is thrown in jail. He's, well, he's not thrown in jail necessarily, but he is persecuted and uh, Jason has to post a bond for him and then Paul escapes and leaves the city uh, under threat. And somehow in the intervening period, Paul is aware that these folks have suffered, that they've suffered uh, certain uh, persecutions in a similar way. Certainly not the same way because here we have Gentiles and there we have Jews. So it's got to be a, a different kind of persecution, but nonetheless uh, persecution. And how does it come? How does persecution arrive? Well, uh, it says they they hinder in verse 16. They oppose in verse 15. Um, and then, of course, the persecution uh, in verse 15 killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. This is a rather extreme way of this, of talking it, but Paul seems pretty passionate here. And um, look at verse uh, 16, and it says that they're these folks who have been persecuting, that is, trying to disrupt the message or thwart Paul's efforts, trying to diminish the nature of God's experience in the Thessalonian church. What is the result? God's wrath has come upon them at last. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Paul's apocalyptic mindset. And I'm I'm always hesitant to do this because I'm not really sure to what extent Paul is apocalyptic here, or if is if he is only uh, you know prophetic because prophets do have similar interests to apocalypticists. Apocalypticists were those who had an understanding of God and God's heaven, and the apocalypticists. You know, we I think we've talked, you may have heard of heard this before, that uh, the apocalyptic thinkers and writers viewed heaven, and they, you know, through a seer, um, through a seer, they could peel back the heavens, and understand what was going on in God's heaven, when the faithful were going under such duress, persecution and strife probably getting its origin in the Maccabean period, that is the period of the revolt, or in the period pre, just in ahead of that revolt, um, they, the, the Jews had suffered persecutions that are chronicled in Josephus and in Maccabees. And in the midst of such suffering and persecution, the faithful were left to ask, where is God in our suffering? The apocalypticist brings a vision of heaven and a, a vision of God where God is not sitting silently by while people suffer, especially the faithful, but rather God is continuing to develop a plan. God deploys angels and tries to thwart agents of evil, including demons and the devil. When Paul says that the wrath of God has come upon them at last, I think that Paul understands this as some kind of a, and this was common in the ancient world, <clears throat> They've filled their bucket up. Uh, the, the full measure uh, of sin had been provided so that they would have to drink the consequences. In the Old Testament period, if you look back at Jeremiah and Isaiah, the expression for the wrath of God is they'll have to drink drink God's wrath to the dregs. And what that usually the dregs, that's what's left on the bottom of the cup. If you have a cup of wine or if you have a cup of coffee uh, or tea, the leaves or the grinds or, or some of the remnants of the grapes that are left over, you don't drink that, you pour that out. The One of the ways that wrath was described was drinking it to the dregs, that is, you had to drink all the way, even the disgu- to the disgusting part. And this could be what Paul envisions for the Thessalonians, that he, and or the, the Thessalonian persecutors, uh, that he that he draws a correspondence with uh, with the churches in Judea. So that's a common image, um, and it's an apocalyptic image, that the wrath of God was somehow being unfolded. We'll see this again in Romans 1, verses 18 through 36, where Paul describes the wrath of God that is to come. How is that supposed to come? Well, he doesn't really describe it very much. He just states it. 
uh, that the wrath of God has come upon them at last. It's not clear as to how it has come or, or in what way. But this gives us a little, um, a little interest. First of all, the Thessalonian believers have suffered somehow. We're not sure how, but they've suffered somehow. And the, the suffering is analogous to, um, not the same, but it's analogous to the way Paul suffered. Which leads us to verse 17. So, they discover, after they were missing, the Thessalonian believers, um, notice how Paul reiterates his own personal interest in verse 18, after his desire to see the Thessalonians face to face, that they, after uh, Paul had been hindered by Satan, he says, so another apocalyptic nod, um, he wants to check in on... um, on them, and so three one, he wants to send Timothy along. Um, look at how Paul says this, verse nineteen. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown, of boasting before our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. So Paul esteems these believers very much, and as- assumes that when Jesus comes in His full glory. And I think that is a, a, a perfect coupling with the coming wrath of God, that Paul wants to present these converts. And I think that's a fair word here. Gentile, Gentile believers were in every way a convert because it had uh, Christianity had moved beyond the parochial sense of Judaism and now was into the Gentile territory. So a convert is... Uh, really what's expressed. And so we get to chapter 3. We can bear it no longer. This is where we hear about sending Timothy. So what about this guy, Timothy? He's mentioned here uh, in verse 1 of chapter 1. In chapter 3, verse 2, Timothy's the one who gets sent to get this message. And then in chapter 3, verse 6, Timothy bears bears the message back. Um... He is probably a young believer. He, uh, the different accounts of him in the different biblical books provide some, some sort of evidence for Timothy. Um, he is a fellow worker of Paul, and you can find him first in Acts 16.1, and then in 17.14, 18.5, so... Uh, 19, 22, and 20, verse 4 of Acts. He's mentioned in Romans in 16, 21, and then in the Corinthian correspondence in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, and 16, 10, and 2 Corinthians 1, 1, and 19. He's mentioned in Philippians and Colossians, in Thessalonians here, and then 2 Thessalonians, and then two letters written to Timothy, and then curiously in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews 13, 23. You can look those references up if you need to. It's not something I would ever expect that you would memorize at all, but it's interesting. He's mentioned more than his share, right? He gets a lot of face time in Scripture. His father was a Greek, uh, according to 16.1. Mother was a godly woman, it says in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul's letter to 2 Timothy. Although, I should point out that most people think 2 Timothy was not written by Paul, but by a person that was trying to uh, imitate Paul's style. I think there's enough here in 2 Timothy to merit full description, and indeed it does seem to to reminisce or to provide a a conscious nod to Paul. Um, It says that uh, he was trained early in the scriptures in 16.3 of Acts, and uh, he says that he is circumcised by Paul. Um, So does that mean that Paul was a moil? It certainly implies that, and uh, it's kind of a strange uh, couple of verses there in Acts 16. And so, uh, Timothy is this kind of person. He is a fellow traveler, but he's one that Paul trusts. Trusts enough. You rec- you may recall that in the first missionary journey, Paul has another partner, and the other partner is John Mark with Barnabas. And for some reason... Uh, John Mark has to leave. Uh, 
and Paul has a falling out with Barnabas because Barnabas wants to give John Mark another chance. And at that point, this is right after the Jerusalem Council, uh, Paul decides he doesn't want to go on a journey with somebody who's going, who's going to, uh, you know, leave. So he, he goes and finds Silas and then by and by Timothy. And Paul in different places in scripture calls uh, Timothy his son in the faith, um, using extremely uh, personal terms. You know, one thing about uh, Paul, and and it's an attribute, I think, of uh, Christianity in in general, or in its in its best form, is that you do have in Christianity the way Paul certainly describes it, this uh, family image that that doesn't go away very easily. I remember going to a place. We were going down to Florida. And I was going to meet a friend of mine at a restaurant. And um, it was in Ocala, and my friend got there considerably ahead of time. And so uh, he waited, he and his wife waited, and as uh, I pulled in, we got out, I got out of the car and went inside. And I was frightened. I thought, well, I le- left him sit there for, for uh, more, than, more time than he deserved. And, uh, but I saw the license plate. I knew the car, so I went in. We sat down and we had a, uh, a nice lunch and it turned out to be Steinbrenner's, uh, a Steinbrenner owned property. So it's full of Yankee memorabilia. And um, the waitress came along and uh, looked at uh, this guy and his wife who were quite old at the time. I think they were in their 80s. It was a mentor to me. And the waitress looks at him and says, oh, you, you have some time with your, uh, your grandkids. And so I must have looked like I was 16 or something. But anyway, um, he looked back at her and says, oh, no, no, no. Uh, We're closer than kin. Closer than kin. And I think that's the way Paul thinks about it. When you're in the body of Christ, you have family resemblances and relationships that are special. And I think the thing about these family relationships, I'm looking at Philippians 2, verses 19 I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I may be cheered when I receive news about you. So verse 22 of that same chapter, Philippians uh, 2, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. So, but the, the faith has this notion of special relationships and close relationships, and it comes from Jesus' own language, talking about Father to the Son, talking about um, in Mark 3 when Jesus looks at his disciples and followers and says, these are my brothers and sisters. So Paul looks at Timothy with very dear terms, and uh, this is the first time I think it's come up, so I wanted to accent that. Uh, Paul's relationship with his fellow workers is always significant. So, um, so Timothy goes on this uh, expedition, and um, he sends. Uh, he said he comes back in verse six and finds out and tells Paul. And what is the news? He says, "I've heard Timothy's brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, and we long to see you." Uh, For this reason, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we render to God for you? For all the joy which we feel for your sake before our God, praying earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So once again, the issue of thanks comes in. And so Paul is quick to point out how grateful to God he is for these Thessalonian believers that Paul's word has taken root and, uh, and they're in, great, in, in, in good shape. Um, lots of joy at their reception and now news of their faith and love uh, and the remembrance uh, of these disciples. When, when Paul uses the term remember, it's always in prayer. Uh, to remember before God. It's almost like if you think about what a satellite 
a function of a satellite is that Paul thinks about this in terms of prayer, that when our prayer goes up to God, it has an impact on those that we pray for, even if they're miles away. In verse 11, um, to the end of chapter 3, what now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all uh, people as we do to you, so that we may establish, he may, God may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So it almost looks like Paul is pumping the brakes for the ending of this letter. Notice that the the love, the love in the community, love one to another, is rooted in an ethic of holiness and of heart purity, hearts unblameable. That is motivation. Um, but this is something that God sees, and the God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints indicates that Paul thinks that this day of judgment will reveal these kinds of things and Paul wants to make sure that they are ready for that. So uh, that's um, that's a key aspect. Um, he's going to move to this in chapter 4 and gets to the heart of a couple of important issues in chapter 4, 1 through 12. And uh, holiness is a key theme. He says uh, he's asking them to live to please God in verse 1. The instructions that Paul gives that the sanctification remain, uh, abstain from unchastity. Verse 4 and 4, that each one of you know how to take a wife for himself in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like heathen who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong, his or her brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. Uh, so, verse 8, Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not, not humanity, but God. Um, verse 9, Concerning the love of the brothers and sisters, you've no need to have anybody right. He's been taught by God to love one another. A classic Christian ethic, to love one another. St. Augustine said, the difficulty with the injunction to love one another is how close love comes to lust and how close lust comes to love. When we objectify another human being, we can call it love, but what we really mean is, boy, they please me. Paul is trying to encourage this group to, to not go that route. And we're going to find out why um, when we come back next time. Um, but in this spot, it's, I want to, I want to uh, point out that there is this underlying issue of unchastity that somehow or other Paul feels it important to relay to them that they're to be chaste, they're to be holy, they're not to treat their bodies like amusement parks or trade partners um, because somehow or other that disrupts the plan and pattern that God had established for them. Um, and so that, that becomes pretty, pretty critical. Um, uh, so that's going to, that takes us to chapter four, uh, verse 12. And when we come back next time, we will start in chapter four, verse 13, and we'll see how far we get in that half hour. So that's going to do it for this, uh, this part portion we got from uh, basically chapter two, three, and the first 12 verses of chapter four, and we'll see you next time.